Play ball. Hot off the press, handicappers from Wager Talk, Sports Memo, and The Gold Sheet have collaborated on the 2023 Wager Talk Media MLB betting guide. From World Series odds to regular season win totals and everything in between, this year's betting guide features previews on all 30 teams, all six divisions, and season-long awards like the Cy Young MVP and Rookie of the Year. Each preview contains key roster acquisitions and departures to help you get up to speed before opening day. Visit wt.buzz slash MLB23 to download your free guide, and we'll see you in the batter's box. Welcome to the NBA Triple Double Show, powered by Sports Memo. I'm your host, Ronald Kabang, also known as UCapper on SportsMemo.com. At UCapper Sports on Twitter, I'll be joined by Moneyline Matt and Jeff Michaels to break down the four games that were happening are happening tonight. Um, before we get into those games, I do want to talk about SportsMemo.com and what we got going on over there. Um, we don't. I don't know if we have any big promos, but we always have free picks and analysis on a daily basis. We got the free live odds page. We got deals pages as well, um, and it also. Um, I think you. I think on the deals page, you can see what's going on over at uh, wagertalk.com as well. So head over to the site. All it takes is an email address to sign up, and you get access to all those things, uh, along with the picks and packages that are on sale from all the Sports Memo handicappers. Uh, with that said, uh, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button before you go. It only takes a couple of clicks and helps our show grow tremendously. Uh, with that said, let's get Matt and Jeff up here with me. What is up, guys? This is a big, a big slate for a, a playoff day of NBA playoffs. Four games uh, tonight. Um, some key games here. Some key closeout games here. And one of the one of those games here, first one up, is the Bucks and the Heat. Um, you know, what are you guys' thoughts on closeout games, real quick, before we go? I mean, three one in a lot of these series with the with the seed with the lower seed being the the one up three one. I know Jeff, you you're probably thinking about some trends in that in, in that angle, right? Yeah, you know, there's some crazy ones looking at these. Like you said, lower seeds. How about closing out a series after back to back game, back to back wins at home? They're just four and seventeen straight up, five and sixteen against the spread. That's for the Knicks, Lakers, and Heat tonight. And when you talk about those higher seeds facing elimination in the first round of the playoffs, that better team or higher seeded team, ten and two against the spread in the last twelve. So. Looking towards the Cavs, Grizzlies, and Bucks just based off of those, but obviously we know that's not enough for a play. So we got some more to say, yeah. I'm sure, about those games. We definitely got more to say on that note. Uh, Matt, uh, man, last couple of days in the NBA, kind of boo boo. How, how's your your week uh, been going? Uh, so my week's been okay. You know, Monday I ended up going two and zero. Uh, yesterday I had one player prop, lost on the hook. So we're still doing good though. You know, we're up four units on the week. I had two three unit plays that I won, a two unit play that I lost. Uh, coming off a winning weekend, you know, we're top three in the past three days, seven days, and thirty days. So feeling really really good. And guys, that study guide that I put out is absolutely fire. You know, we had the Knicks winning that one outright. We had the Lakers winning that one. Uh, we had the Kings plus two and a half. So a lot of good stuff on that playoff study guide. I do it for the Eastern Conference and Western Conference every single <clears> round. <throat> Going to be completely free. All you got to do is download it. So if you're someone who does like playoff futures, playoff series futures, uh, playoff series parlays, stuff like that, Definitely keep an eye on that because once this round ends, I'm going to get right back to it, have another one out for you guys completely free once again. And it just gives you a good hold on what's going on in the series, injuries to look for, uh, it has all the against the spread stats. So, again, another thing that we're doing over at Sports Memo and Wager Talk just to give you, try and give you a little bit more of an edge. Yep. All right. Well, let's get into the games, guys. Uh, first one up, Knicks and the Cavs. Knicks lead the series 3-1. They've been, they've been doing it with amazing defense, offensive boards, creating extra possessions for themselves. All four games have gone under so far as well. Uh, Cavs haven't even reached 100 at, at any point in this series so far. Um, let's start with you, Jeff, here. You know, do you look towards another under in this game? I, both teams are looking pretty healthy, uh, but it seems like nobody can really score in this series here. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm looking for a big game out of somebody here. I, I I think I got the look on it in my best bet here, but I do I think there's gonna be a little more scoring. I don't know if I'm willing to bet the over after the numbers that we've seen in this series so far. Uh, but I do think that there's potential for one of these stars in this game really to go off. 
I mean, you look at the Knicks, they need some help in terms of offensive production. I mean, they're, they are up 3-1, obviously, mm-hmm. but they only have four players averaging double-digit points, and they only have two guys on their roster in the postseason that are averaging over 15 points per game. But I think really the biggest difference here has been the rebounding. I mean, I know the Knicks are were number two in the regular season in rebounding differential, and they're number two in the postseason right now, too. They only have two guys that are over 6'9 on that roster, and they got four guys that are grabbing six or more boards per game. So that's a huge difference. And they're 9-5 and five against the spread against this Cavs team in the last three years. So there's a lot going towards this Knicks. I mean, there's an endless list of trends. 23-11 and 11 against the spread in the second half of the season. 17-7 and seven off a home win this year. 13-4 and four against the spread on the road after two or more consecutive wins. So, I mean, there's an endless list of things that point towards the Knicks. But Cleveland, 8-3 and three against the spread as a single-digit favorite after back-to-back games allowing opponents to shoot 45% or better. And they're one of the best teams at home in the league. So I'm attacking a player prop here for my best bet, but I'm hesitant to side with all those trends on the Knicks just because Cleveland's got their back against the wall and they're playing at home here. Yeah, I mean, the Knicks have been able to, you talked about rebounds, right? The Knicks have been limiting uh, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley in, in both scoring and in rebounds. Um, I, historically, dude, I looked at how the how number five seeds in the playoffs uh, perform on the road in game five of a series when they're up 3-1. In the history of the database, you know, you know um, Matt, we uh, sorry, Jeff, we, we use SDQL a lot, Killer Sports and, and other websites, but in the history of the Killer Sports database, there are two and seven straight up and uh, against the spread, also seven and two to the under. The average first quarter margin of those games on these tight lines as well, um, their first quarter margin is minus two and a half, uh, minus 4.3 4, 4. points in the first half margin, and then full game margin minus 8.8. And we have a line of Cleveland, I think it's minus uh, uh, five, it's, it's five and a half right now, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But the last time this happened, where the, the five seed is up 3 1 was in 2020 it was actually the knicks but on the other side they were down uh they were down uh 3-1 right so the hawks in in the five seed uh ended up smashing the knicks in that game even though the trends say to to fade that team that like i said the knicks are in the reverse role today and now the five seed they're the better team uh now than they were before obviously i think with the roster makeup but history says in this situation the Cavs should be able not only uh, the, at the end of the game, but it seems like wire to wire for the most part. Um, what are your thoughts on this one, Matt? I, I feel like to me, to me, the under is still calling my name out, even though it's a low total. It just neither team has hit that. I mean, Cleveland specifically hasn't even hit that century mark at all in the series. But uh, are you seeing anything on the side or or the total, or are you sticking with the prop? Yeah, honestly, I don't think I'll have anything from this game, if I'm being honest. Um, But when breaking it down, you know, to your point, talking about the under, you know, even before the show, we were talking about this. And when evaluating this series ahead of time, and essentially the reason that I took the Knicks in the series, who were an underdog, it's because the Cleveland Cavaliers just don't have scoring right now. You know, if you shut down Donovan Mitchell, there's really just not much else that this team has to, you know, put points on the board. You know, of course you have Darius Garland, who's, you know, a solid scorer. He's a very nice facilitator, stuff like that. But when a team like the Cleveland Cavaliers goes against a squad like the New York Knicks, who, when you take a look at it, you know, you got Jared Allen, you got Mitchell Robinson, they kind of counter each other out. Then you got Evan Mobley and you got Julius Randle, they kind of counter each other out. So the huge advantage that they always have in their height and in their size just isn't there anymore. So once it cancels each other out, you have to depend more on the outside jump shooting, which, you know, as we know, Donovan Mitchell is a guy who can absolutely go off. But if he's not hitting from the outside and Darius Garland's not hitting from the outside, where are you going to look? Isaac Okoro? Like, come on, that's a little tough. You know, and then you got Chetty Osman coming off the bench. You know, that's a little tough as well. So there's just not all that much that this team has. Karis LeVert, you know, another guy who's just, you know, one game he's going to have 15. The next game he's going to go one for eight and shoot have two points. So, you know, that's just how I look at this as well. It's, it's tough for me to see a lot of points here. 
And, you know, if I were to go one way, I would go with the Cleveland Cavaliers and the spread just because you guys know I love it when a team is has their back up against the wall. Uh, they have to respond. It's a do or die situation. But I would actually look at maybe a player prop or something along those lines. I agree with Jeff um, and think some of these players have a chance to go off in this matchup. And uh, for me, once again, you know, I would be with the Cavaliers in this spot. And to your point, Ron, I think I would be with the under as well. I don't think that this is going to be one of those games the New York Knicks really go off. And then when you take a look at this New York Knicks bench, they do have very solid defender. Uh, McBride, you know, that that point guard um, that they've been using as of late. He's a very, very solid defender. And then you got someone like Josh Hart coming off the bench, Obi Toppin coming off the bench. I still give this edge to the New York Knicks, uh, even though I do think the Cleveland Cavaliers will get this game. And I do think it will be low, lower scoring again, to your point, Ron. Yeah, maybe maybe if you like the Knicks, they'll probably take it in the next game uh, at, at home, right? Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next one here, the Lakers and the Grizzlies. Lakers, another 3-1 series where the, the lower seed is leading in the series. Uh, Lakers also getting it done offensively. If it wasn't for uh, – oh, sorry, sorry, getting it done defensively. If it wasn't for overtime in game four, the Grizzlies would have stayed under their team total in all four games so far this series. It, it would also have been uh, their straight – fourth straight um, – uh, Full, a full game under in the series as well, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, injury perspective, uh, AD, LeBron, and Schroeder are all probable. Nothing on the Grizzlies side here, so the Grizzlies are pretty healthy. I mean, I know LeBron and, and AD is always on the injury report, so uh, maybe that's nothing really of note. Uh, from from here, the Lakers, man, they, they just have been getting it done with depth and versatility. Uh, we've been saying it a lot post-All-Star break, especially with, with Matt on the shows here, but the Lakers, what the Lakers did at the trade deadline really put them in position uh, to uh, for where they are today. Uh, Matt, let's, get with, let's start with you here. What are your thoughts on this game with the Lakers and the Grizzlies? Yeah, uh, before we even get into this game, one thing that I really just want to say is this Lakers team is actually starting to scare me. Like, I actually think they can make a run in this Western <laughs> Conference. I think the depth that they have, I think the shooting that they have, I think the defense that they have, it's very dangerous. And I say it scares me because you guys know I can't stand LeBron James, but you got to speak it how it is. You know, this Lakers team is very, very good. They're very deep. They have, they have height, they have defenders, they have a little bit of everything. And, you know, when you look at that collision course with the Lakers and maybe the Phoenix Suns or even the Denver Nuggets, you know, especially with the Phoenix Suns, they don't have much of a bench. And then as for the Denver Nuggets facing off against the Lakers, the Lakers have a huge edge there defensively. So for me, ah, the road for the Lakers is looking pretty good. Although I, getting to this game now, I don't think they get it done here. Okay. Uh, originally I said the Lakers would get this done in seven. I don't think it's seven anymore. I think it's uh it's probably six, I would say. Um, but I think this is going to be a huge spot for the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies were one of the best home teams throughout all of basketball. Uh, I think this is a spot where John Morant can bounce back a little bit as well. Desmond Bain, we saw get it going. And, you know, Jaron Jackson is kind of the guy who needs to get it going in this spot too. And I know we touched on Tyus Jones last time. He did a little bit, not all that much. But again, to beat this Lakers team, they have a lot of depth with like guys like Rui Hachimura, Dennis Schroeder coming off the bench, you know, that they're very deep. So you need your bench to step up like Salty Aldama. You need guys like that to come out, make shots. And, you know, Roddy has actually been the one coming out, making shots. And even actually been taking more threes than sometimes like Desmond Bain was. So for me, a lot of these guys, their star players just have to be more aggressive. We need to see Desmond Bain do something similar that he did the other night. You know, he was very aggressive looking for his shot actually didn't shoot the three ball all that well. And I think that could very, very well potentially change. And then John Morant on top mm -hmm. of that, you know, John Morant didn't even have 20 points after that 40 plus point outing. I think he gets back to it because if there is a spot that you take advantage of against this Lakers team, it's generally the point guard. They don't guard the point guard position all that well with D'Angelo Russell at the point guard position or Dennis Schroeder, whoever it may be. And you also have to remember looking back at last game, there was a point where I believe D'Angelo Russell had nine straight points making three threes in a row to get this Lakers team back in the game on the road in Memphis. I don't think anything like that happens. And I think this is going to be a spot. Memphis does take advantage of being at home. You know, this is still a Lakers team, although I love what they've been doing. I think they've been playing great basketball. They do tend to have a lot of letdowns while on the road. This is an older team. LeBron had a high output outing. So for me, it would be the Grizzlies minus four in this spot. 
Grizzlies minus four for Matt. Jeff, what are your thoughts on this one? Are you do are you in alignment with Matt, or are you looking towards another thing here, where maybe the total or another prop? Yeah, you know, maybe I should have started off the Cavs game with this, but not a play that I gave out as a premium play or anything of the sort. Not anything that I do very often. But personally, I was looking through it this morning. And my first instinct looking at this card was actually to bet a three-team money line parlay with the three teams that have their back against the wall here and get rid of the spread. Because I do feel like they all, you know, are in a situation, like I said, with their backs against the wall. And we kind of saw, especially for Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks, how that turned out last night. You know, the one thing that did stand out to me, I looked at LeBron specifically, he's seven and one straight up and against the spread on the road in his last eight attempts to close out a series. But the most recent one was in 2020, which I believe was the year of the bubble. And that was the only one that he had with L.A. Everything else was with Cleveland. So he is 1-0, obviously, with L.A., but, you know, 6-1 and one with Cleveland. So it is a little bit of a, a, a you know, a strained sample size there, I guess, because you're looking at an entire different franchise that you're playing with. But I just don't see this Memphis team continuing to, to shoot the way that they have. I mean, teams that have shot back-to-back games under 40%, in the playoffs against the same opponent and now they're a favorite of three or more are actually just seven and 18 7 18 and one against the spread excuse me covering just 28 percent but you look at memphis specifically they're 14 and 6 against the spread this year after two or more ats losses and they're 17 and 6 against the spread in the last two years after two or more straight up losses but you know, shooting like that, it is kind of hard to turn around. But really, I think the biggest thing, again, that stands out to me, all three of these teams, who would have thought Grizzlies, Cavs, and Bucks? okay, maybe one, maybe two of them would be in a situation that they're fighting for their lives. But losing round one as a higher seed at home, you know, I, I would definitely back all three of these teams on the money line. It's just a question of if you're going to lay the spread. And for me, it's, it is it is still kind of hard to bet against LeBron James and to close out a series. But I did see five out of the last six meetings between these two teams in Memphis have stayed under the total and seven out of the last 12 as well. So could be looking at the under there. I like Memphis money line, but I know that's a big price to pay, obviously, unless you, you know, parlay it with like a Cavs team, for instance. And if you want to throw the bucks in there, but again, then we're talking what, 11 points. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you guys touch on the bounce back here for the Grizzlies side. I mean, I know the Lakers have been pretty good defensively post all-star break in this series though they're limiting the grizz to like 41.6 percent field from the field also the grizzlies shooting a ton of threes and only hitting 30 percent of them um i think uh, i forgot who it was but that mentioned desmond bain not hitting the three-point ball that well but i think maybe there's a bounce back opportunity here tonight during the regular season the grizz shot 49 percent from the field and 36 percent from three so like i said the bounce back i feel like might be here for the grizzlies i don't i think the lakers end up obviously i think the the Lakers end up winning the series. I think me and Matt talked about this before the series even started, that there was a very good possibility of that happening. Um, but I think that defensively, the, the the Lakers numbers might seem to be that they're overachieving right now. Um, here, especially at home where we know the Grizzlies play a little bit better, there's going to be a huge boost for them. So I can only look towards the Grizzlies to at least win and cover this game tonight. We'll see what happens in game six or, or if there's even a game seven. But one thing to mention, though, uh, because of the parity in the league, it was more common before for lower seeds to actually be up 3-1 in the first round series. In the history of the database, 21 instances where the lower seed was 3-1 in a series, those teams are 4-17 and straight up, 8-13 and 8-13 against the spread, 12-8-1 to the under. So that trend there points towards uh, the Grizzlies side tonight. And also the under, the more recent instance was that one Hawks game, Hawks Knicks games that I talked about in that first series. But that trend fits the bill for the three games tonight: the the um, the uh, Knicks Cavs, this series that we're talking about, then the one that we have up next here, the Heat and the Bucks. Uh, so I would look towards the Grizzlies there, and, and since it's leading up to the Heat Bucks, that that's the next game here. So we'll talk about that one right now. The Heat lead that series, like I said, 3-1 as the lower seed, uh, one game away from finishing off the, this huge upset here. I don't think anyone, a lot of people expected this at all. 
these guys, uh, these teams are 4-0 to the over so far in the series as well. It seems like there's a lot of pace of play or just limited defense. And obviously, there's two games where Giannis didn't play. That could have been impactful as well as far as the numbers goes. But um, Bam is probable. Uh, Giannis expected to play as well. But we don't know how his his back is going to um, you know feel after that game, uh, game, uh, game four. So, Matt, let's go with you here. What are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, honestly, first off, you have to, you know, talk about Jimmy Butler and what he did in the last game. Just an absolutely amazing performance. If you guys were tuning into that game, you absolutely got to see a treat because that was one of the best games I've ever seen by any player throughout the NBA. And Jimmy Butler just absolutely went off. But with that being said, I do not think he can do it again. You know, if he does do it again, I don't know if you guys have seen that rumor. Maybe he really is Michael Jordan's son. But I don't think he's going to do it right here. I think <laughs> this is going to be a buck spot for sure. Uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo is the best player in the league. He's the most dominant offensively. He's the most dominant defensively. And if he has one of those spots where he just gets it going, completely takes over the game, I do think this is going to be a double-digit win for the Milwaukee Bucks. You know, the Bucks are down 3-1, and I believe they're around like plus 150 or maybe even lower to win the series right now. I'll have to check on that. But I still would take the Bucks to win this series. You know, even though Jimmy Butler absolutely went off, took over the game, this is still a Bucks team that was up 10 points on the road with a lot of their team not playing very well. Drew Holiday played absolutely terrible once again. You know, Chris Middleton had an average game. Uh, Bobby Portis had an average game. Brooke Lopez was actually the one that went off with Giannis. And if they have a more complete style basketball game, I believe they handle this Heat team by double digits, no problem. I believe the spread is at 12 right now. I don't like taking big spreads. I will not have this as an official play, but if I had to pick one way, it would definitely be with the Milwaukee Bucks tonight. I think after a game like that, you're a little bit embarrassed. You're coming back home, and you've got that fire under your ass. So I really do think that this Milwaukee Bucks team is going to go out get this done. I think this could be one of those games that is over by halftime as well. So I'm going to be completely staying away from this in terms of same game parlays, parlays, stuff like that. If I were to do anything though, it would be bucks minus 12 in this spot. Yeah. I mean, if any team is going to come back from three, one, this bucks team can do it. Obviously with, especially with uh, Miami struggling with injuries uh, in that aspect. And you can't, you can't just rely on Jimmy Butler the whole time. Right. Um, for that from that aspect while you were talking you mentioned something uh, about a double digit line and i looked in the database while you were talking double digit favorites when they're down in the series nine and oh straight up seven and two against the spread in the history of the database so the the last five instances have covered bucks actually did it in 2019 against the magic so it's not new territory for them it seems like they've done it before they could do it again tonight that game also went yeah. under by a huge margin um, so I think, I mean, I agree with you. My best bet is on this, so I'm going to save it for the best bet section. But let's go to let's go to Jeff here. What are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, you know, again, I think this is the question, or this is the biggest question mark in terms of that 3-1 deficit. You know, I think that, like you guys kind of alluded to, you know, there was, there was talks about the Knicks upsetting the Cavs. There was talks about the Lakers upsetting the Grizzlies. But the fact that Miami is up 3-1 right now, even with Antetokounmpo's injury, you know, is probably the most shocking. And I was looking out of the eight teams that are going tonight, Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo are the highest scoring duo in the postseason on average this year. And with that, Adebayo is only averaging 16.8 points per game. So they don't even have two 20 plus point per game scorers. And the duo is averaging over 53 points per game. So, you know, it goes to show you Jimmy Butler is number two in the postseason right now with scoring. And they've been mm-hmm. impressive, too. You know, four and, not only are they four and one against the spread in their last five games as an underdog, but they're four and one straight up in those games, too. And they're, they weren't one point, two point underdog games that we're talking about. They're seven, eight, nine point underdogs that they're, you know, pulling off and pulling off upsets in regards to and. But you have a Miami team, you look in the big picture, what they've done all year, consistency is is not something that they've excelled at. They're just 5-17 and 17 against the spread this season after two or more consecutive wins. And you got a Milwaukee team that, again, I sound like a broken record, but has their back against the wall on their home court, you know, down 3-1. to one. So you got to even win two to tie the series. You do have, hopefully, a healthy Antetokounmpo back. 
and they're 11 and two against the spread this season off of a upset loss as a favorite. But interestingly enough, one of those two losses is against this Heat team in the last game. You know, that's something that stands out to me. An 11 and two ATS record is impressive, but you know, one of the two, one of the two teams that got it done this year was this Miami Heat team. With that being said, the MVP is the MVP for a reason, and you really can't put a number on on the lead there. I think so. I would be going Milwaukee here. You know, not a not a premium play at this point with a minus twelve line, but definitely leaning towards the Bucks here tonight. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me there. Uh, all right, let's move on to this last game. But like I said, uh, my my best bet is going to be on that game, so I'll, I'll skip that uh, for now. Um, let's go on to this last game here, the Warriors and the Kings. Uh, this is the only series in the first round that hit the 2-2 uh, score, a uh, series score. The home team's getting it done on both in all four games here. Uh, game four was one of the few games in these playoffs where we've seen the, the winner fail to cover the spread, but we have a short line here, so it almost seems like the winner should be able to cover that small spread. Obviously, the, the news of Fox was a big, big um was big for this the last couple of days. Uh, officially listed as questionable now, but last I heard, he's likely to play uh, through the fractured finger on his shooting hand. It's crazy because the Warriors were opened up as one and a half point dogs, right? Then they flipped to four and a half, like as high as four and a half point favorites after the Fox injury. And then yesterday there was news that he's going to play through the pain and be able to show up today. And they moved it down to the Warriors to be uh, one and a half point favorites uh, with those updated news. But that line has been kind of going all sorts of ways right now. Don't know where to go with it for the most part, but we know that Warriors struggle on the road, right? Both offensively and defensively. But I think this Fox injury impacts the Kings a lot. A lot uh, also impacts the flow of the game. Not only just you know, uh, not only just how efficient the offense is going to be, but also the pace of play. Because if he has to pay, play through pain, he's probably not going to have the ball in his hands uh, too much to to push that pace. So. We might even see like more, uh, you know, Davion Mitchell, who's who's more of a defensive-minded player. But this is likely not going to be an official play. But I was thinking of maybe focusing in on the King side specifically and just taking their team total under. Uh, whether they win or lose, I, to me, it won't matter. It just feels like not having Fox at full strength is going to affect them. Like I said, pace of play is going to be a bit slower, possibly, and then also, you know, the offensive efficiency might take a hit as well. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I do find it kind of interesting that uh, Fox came out and said something yesterday about it. You know, I th- I feel like, especially yeah. in the playoffs, you're usually trying to keep it hush-hush. You know, you're trying not to give them time to prepare for exactly what they're going to see. And, you know, the fact that they had a day to prepare for Fox coming back, I think, is, is a big benefit to Golden State. You know, being able to think what mm. you're going to get. But as you mentioned, I don't think you're going to get 100% De'Aaron Fox, obviously. But with that being said, I mean, Golden State, in my opinion, should feel fortunate that this series is even tied. I mean, they shot 50% still last game, but they were a seven-point favorite and only won by a point and and barely missed losing that game. You know, they're 11-4 and four straight up against Sacramento in the last three years, so they're winning the games. But they're, Sacramento is actually 9-6 and six against the spread in those games. So Sacramento's covering these spreads. They're keeping them close. They're fighting. And Golden State is just 6-17 and against the spread this year on the road after at least one win. So Golden State, you know, is the team that wants to be playing at home, obviously. We've seen them play better at home. And I think just having Deer and Fox in the lineup is going to be an advantage for Sacramento. I mean, they've dominated the division. They're 14-6 and six against the spread this year against their own division. But, you know, being able to have another option out there and, and not having to rely on Sabonis so much as a passing, you know, assist man out there and, and even having Deer and Fox who can, you know, maybe throw some left-handed assists, I think that could be a way that we could be looking, him not be attacking the basket, not risking more injury to that hand, but looking to use, you know, his smarts and his passing out there to – to facilitate and to create buckets and create baskets is is a way that I think, you know, could be a valuable option to attack. And I do think just having them on the floor as even a decoy is an advantage for this Sacramento team. So, you know, I think I'm going with all four of the home teams here tonight and going with Sacramento, especially getting points at home and, 
And keeping that last game mm-hmm. so close in Golden State, you know, it almost feels like this line should be a pick on me. Yeah, what do you think, uh, Matt? What are your thoughts on this one? Do you think the Fox the Fox injury, I mean, it's his shooting hand, right? A fractured finger in his mm-hmm. shooting hand. If, it, if I looked at it correctly, I think it was his index finger, which is typically the last finger that rolls off of the ball, right? I mean, he was talking about it mm-hmm. in the interview. He has to feel... He has to feel that uh, when he releases a ball, but if he's wearing that little piece on it, could affect the offense, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on this game here? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, I read that article last night um, in which De'Aaron Fox came out, said that he definitely did have a broken finger, and typically he would be out one to two weeks. And if it wasn't the playoffs, he would be sitting out. But it's obviously the playoffs. You got to go on. And uh, he basically said he's going to play, going to be playing through the pain, everything along those lines. And, you know, to both of your points, I do think it is a benefit, obviously, to the Sacramento Kings just having De'Aaron Fox on the court. Is it going to affect him? Yeah, I think it has to because De'Aaron Fox has definitely been getting his three-point shot going as of late. You know, he's not known for being a three-point shooter, but he's been hitting those step-back three-point shots. Um, and if that is your shooting hand, then, yeah, I would imagine that does that does affect you and it could potentially uh, cause Fox to have less points tonight, stuff like that. But with the Kings, you know, one thing that we've talked about all season long is the amount of scores that they have, the amount of shooters that they have on that team. And my best bet is from this game as well. And I guess might as well just keep rolling into that because it's a main point of mine. And it's Kevin Herter over 14 and a half points. And Kevin Herter has been kind of quiet this series so far. And this is the spot. If your star player is hurt, potentially not going to be able to take as many shots in this game, then you got to look to guys like Kevin Herter to step up. Malik Monk, Harrison Barnes, Davion Mitchell, all those role players who have been pretty solid from shooting outside this series. You know, another guy obviously that needs to step up a little bit is DeMontis Sabonis. He has been playing well, but I think he does need to also facilitate a little bit more too, just in case Fox can't do that with his finger. You know, it's going to be a feeling out process out there. You know, I don't know exactly what Fox is going to do, just like he might not know exactly what he's going to be able to do until he feels that pain, until until he starts dribbling the basketball, passing it, shooting it, stuff like that. But if there is a team that has enough scoring options to still continue to get this done, I think it's the Sacramento Kings. So once again, I am going to be with the Kings here. You guys know I've been back in the Kings all season long, all through the playoffs. But this is very similar to me than game one and game two. You know, game one, underdog, one. Game two, underdog, one. People love to doubt this Kings team. And I very under, very much understand how fun the Warriors are. They're that sexy team with Steph Curry, with Klay Thompson. These guys just pulling up from all over the place. But this is still a team that was 11 and 30 against the spread on or, or straight up on the road this season, and they're 0 and 2 in the playoffs. You know, it's kind of they got to prove it to me. Prove it to me that you can go out on the road and beat a playoff caliber team. The Warriors have not done that yet, and even though they've added Andrew Wiggins to the lineup, it's not like they're playing exceptional defense. This Kings team is still getting it done. So for me, I'm definitely going to be with the Kings in the spot, and the guy that I'm going to be looking to with my best bet today also is going to be Kevin Herter. Kevin Herter is one of the streakiest shooters throughout the NBA. He's only hit this in one game so far in this playoff series against the Golden State Warriors. He's one of the best three-point shooters in the uh, for the Sacramento Kings or throughout the league. He runs that pick and roll very, very well with DeMontis Sabonis, that high pick and roll. And the Warriors do like to play drop defense sometimes. So if De'Aaron Fox is hurt, not handling the ball as much, I expect a lot from Kevin Herter coming off that pick and roll with DeMontis Sabonis, pulling up from the three-point line, getting into his mid-range, hitting some of those mid-range shots. I think he's going to be far more active tonight, and it's essentially because he needs to be, and this Kings team desperately needs this win at home. So for me, one more time, it's the Kings money line, and it is Kevin Herter over 14 and a half points. I like it. Yeah, he has to bounce back here. Jeff, um, Jeff what, are your, what is your best bet? I think you're doing a prop play as well, right? Yeah, you want to talk about bounce back? You want to talk about feeling like a similar <laughs> situation to game one and game two? Hey, I'm feeling it. I'm not going to the same game. But I'm going to that Cleveland Knicks game, and I'm looking Donovan Mitchell tonight, over 34 and a half points and assists, sitting in minus 115, and I think that's a good price. You know, I alluded to it earlier. I think that there's a room for somebody on this Cavs team to go off. I do feel like it's going to be Donovan Mitchell, 
But even looking at his assist numbers recently and the potential opportunity for the big men to go off, because I think they're due as well in Cleveland, I think it gives him an opportunity to pick up assists there too. I mean, he played 42 minutes in the last game and he put up just 11 points and he's had five plus assists in all four games in the series so far. But you look at the first two games in Cleveland, he's averaging 38 points in assists per game. He had 21 assists in those first two games combined. He had 13 and he had eight in the first two in Cleveland. And he ended the regular season with four straight games of 40-plus points. So we know he's capable of doing it, obviously. And he almost had another one in game one. you know. And in his Cleveland tenure, he's played pretty well at home against this Knicks team. I mean, he's hit this number in three out of the last four. And if you go back to Utah, he's hit it in four out of the last five. You look what he's done against the Knicks this season, regular season this year. He averaged over 39 points and assists combined, 31.8 points and seven and a half assists in those games. And I also mentioned this quickly earlier with Trey Young too, but back against the wall kind of performance, it takes something special. We saw Trey put up 38 and 13. And even though Minnesota lost yesterday, I mean, Anthony Edwards put up 29, eight and seven and Cat put up 26 and 11. So we've seen what these big stars can do with these, you know, in these must win situations, especially at home here for Cleveland. So I like Donovan Mitchell, 34 and a half points and assists, leaving those assists open because we know he can get double digit assists too to, you know, extra cushion there as well. So for the value, we're going to throw those assists in there and I'm going over 34 and a half points and assists for Donovan Mitchell tonight. Yeah, they're gonna really have to. He's he's gonna have to bounce back a lot. The big thing is he's turned been turning over the ball a lot as well. So as long as he take takes care of the ball, he'll have have those opportunities. He's obviously gonna have the usage here with their back against the wall. My best bet here is actually gonna be on the Heat uh, team total under. Um, you know, obviously you know Jimmy Butler playoff Jimmy here has been balling out of control for Miami. Um, but if you look at it, he has not hit a forty plus game all season long. Last season, he did it four times. All four games that he did it was in the playoffs. And in those, in the following games, the Heat were one and three straight up, one and three against the spread. Also three and one to the under. If you look at this team specifically now, the way that they're put together, outside of Jimmy, there really wasn't much support uh, from any of the, the role players until maybe the fourth quarter uh, of that game where, you know, obviously it's just a historic game from Jimmy Butler, but... I think the Bucks are gonna gonna they're gonna make it a point to stop Jimmy tonight and make the other guys win the game. But there really is no second guy on this squad at the moment with uh, Tyler Harrell hurt, obviously. And then Bam, he can't really do anything with Yanni uh, with Yanni with uh, Giannis and and Brooke Lopez protecting the paint there. So if they stop Jimmy, I, I don't I don't know where that support is gonna come from. They're gonna have to have like ten, you know, the rest of the guys basically put up double digits uh, for the most part because. Out, just outside of Jimmy, I don't know who could, who could hit twenty point mark uh, uh, themselves. So uh, otherwise, I, I just I just can see the Heat staying under the century mark. To be honest, I don't know if they hit hundred points if if they stop Jimmy. I also think the Bucks. If you want to look at it from a, if you want to pivot, uh, I think the Bucks come out strong with a sense of urgency early and dominate that first quarter as well here at home. Um, obviously, that the that trend that I mentioned earlier, the double digit favorites down in the series points towards the Bucks as well. So if you like the Bucks, lean towards that way. Uh, that's a trend that supports you. But I'm gonna look towards the Heat team total under. I think they struggle offensively tonight against the Bucks. With that said, guys, that's our best bet. We we broke down all four games today. Um, um, next show will be Friday with uh, myself, uh, Matt, and Tony Finn. Uh, make sure you guys hit the uh, hit the like and subscribe button, and then. After you do that, head straight to sportsmemo.com and see what we got going on over there. We got the live odds pages, the free free um, picks, uh, free uh, analysis, uh, and also the, the picks in uh, packages available from all our Sports Memo handicappers. Until Friday, guys, our next show, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard on the same channel. Uh, good luck with our reaction. Till next time, peace. Play ball. Hot off the press, handicappers from Wager Talk, Sports Memo, and The Gold Sheet have collaborated on the 2023 Wager Talk Media MLB Betting Guide. From World Series odds to regular season win totals and everything in between, this year's betting guide features previews on all 30 teams, all six divisions, and season-long awards like the Cy Young MVP and Rookie of the Year. 
Each preview contains key roster acquisitions and departures to help you get up to speed before opening day. Visit wt.buzz MLB 23 to download your free guide and we'll see you in the batter's box.